HRN listeners. As we celebrate our 15th year, we are deepening our commitment to giving voice to the next generation of food system storytellers, and we need your help. Our internship and fellowship programs help activate new possibilities for underrepresented and underestimated young people through experiential journalism, audio engineering, and production training. Through these unique programs, HRN helps food equity stewards build essential workforce readiness skills that expand their potential and foster economic mobility. Please consider supporting these critical programs. And with a minimum donation, you can be entered to win a dinner for two at an amazing restaurant in one of eight cities and tickets to a concert at a great venue in one of those cities. We have incredible partners across the country who have donated as they also share our passion for helping to educate the next generation of food system storytellers. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. And make sure you donate before March 31st. Thank you. Today's program is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. Did you know that Wisconsin wins more national and international cheese awards than any other state or country? To learn more, visit wisconsincheese.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. We're a member-supported food radio network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. Join our hosts as they lead you through the world of craft brewing, behind the scenes of the restaurant industry, inside the battle over school food, and beyond. Find us at heritageradionetwork.org. Welcome to The Line. I'm your host, Eli Sussman. Today, we're talking hamburgers. There's no end to the various burger variations and price points available in New York City. There's even multiple social clubs that exist in pursuit of locating the perfect version. My guest today is the creative brains behind one of America's most exciting fast casual brands and home to one of perhaps America's best hamburgers, depending on who you ask. Mark Rosati joined the Shake Shack team at the original Madison Square Park location as a manager in the summer of 2007. He's helped develop permanent menu items and local seasonal specials for Shake Shack locations throughout the United States and in many countries abroad. He was a cook at New York City's Gramercy Tavern from 2005 to 2007 before joining up with the Shake Shack crew. Shake Shack now has over 100 locations, including international outposts in Japan, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Dubai, South Korea, Turkey, and the U.K., Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Eli. All right, let's start off with the question that everyone is wondering about. How many hamburgers do you eat in a normal week? And have you, <laughs> have you ever had a week where you are sick of eating Shake Shack hamburgers? Oh, totally. Well, what I actually do is I'm always eating like the various components for inspiration and also just quality control to make sure it's really delicious. But to actually sit down and eat like the Shack burger... That's very rare, maybe four or five times a year because I want to keep that special. I want to keep it magical because before I worked for Shake Shack, I was a fan. I went to the original location in Madison Square Park and wait in line for like an hour and a half in the summertime to get the burgers. And as much as I didn't want to wait in line, when I finally got the burger, I'm like, all right, you're lucky this time, Shake Shack. It was good. I'm happy. But like there's something fun about that. So I never want to stale myself on that. We're going to get to Madison Square Park in a little while, but first, let's jump way back to the beginning. You grew up in Connecticut, and so for me, I'm from Metro Detroit. There was this place called Hunter House. It it sort of looks like it's locked in 1951, you know? It's <laughs> it's it's a white box, and they have the little menu, and, you know, they serve the milkshake, the burger, the fry. I'm curious... Oh, yeah. um, you know, and Mich- in Michigan, it's like a griddled steamed burger with sort of smashed onions mm-hmm. on and a steamed bun. So sort of like White Castle style for those listening that aren't super familiar with that. Uh-huh. So my question for you is, what's your burger memory like in Connecticut? And is there a Connecticut um, style of hamburger that you grew up with? Connecticut definitely has its own very quirky uh, hamburger culture, hot dog culture, fish culture. Um, my actual early memories of burgers was from my family. It was going to the beach in the summertime. We were very close to Rhode Island, great beaches. My dad would bring the hibachi out and we would just cook up burgers with cheese, a little bit of onion and mustard. And that's my memory of the perfect hamburger. 
when I was growing up in Connecticut, I wasn't the biggest fan of hamburgers back then. I liked hot dogs, and our style of hot dogs was to split them open and griddle both sides and put them in a butter and toasted bun. I love that. Yeah. Because you get the char, you get that interior and exterior char, and the snap is still there. Oh, totally. Yeah. It's such a flavorful, delicious way of cooking that that actually started really kind of getting my motors going. And uh, when I started to really discover burgers, I discovered Connecticut has like a storied history with many different types. Some people say the very first hamburger in America was served in a place in New Haven called Louis Lunch. We have that. We have another place called Shady Glen, which is another kind of shack where their claim to fame is they put four slices of cheese and they meet them in the middle of the patty as it's cooking, let the cheese drape on the grill and get crispy and then pull the crispy edges up, put it on the bun. So it almost looks like the cheese creates like a sombrero around the top of the <laughs> bun. So we've had wild burgers. But when I think of what like inspired me and like now inspires like my thoughts at Shake Shack, it's like the simplicity of that beach burger my parents cooked. Interesting. So New Haven, potentially home to United States' first burger, first pizza as well. A lot of people say that. It has the best pizza in the United States. <laughs> yes. So New Haven has some serious food credibility For that sure. maybe a lot of people don't think about. So you said that your dad would bust out the grill when you were down at the beach. I'm curious what type of food household you grew up in. Uh -huh. uh, a lot of people that live close to New York ended up coming here as kids and experiencing world cuisine that you know wasn't truly available 20, 30 years ago before... Every city had every <laughs> style of ethnic restaurant. Yeah. So did you come to New York and try Asian food and Greek food and Middle Eastern food and, and all that stuff? Or did you really stick close to home? I, I was lucky where I grew up in Connecticut, a little town called Stonington. And it's like, it's almost equal distance from New York City and Boston. So every year we would come to New York maybe twice, go to Boston twice. And that was fun for me because our city or our town I grew up in, it had its fun food like we we have a lot of fry shacks like clam shacks like lobster roll shacks that's what i grew up being that was done very well but to come to like new york or boston and get exposed to like chinese restaurants and go to places that were doing middle eastern food like that was very exciting and i didn't know what i was eating i didn't understand it but on the most basic level it was very satisfying it was very like comforting to me too and i think those memories kind of made me go home and say, why don't I have this stuff at home? I do crave that. And maybe maybe there was something about th those experiences that when it was time to move on and go to college, I wanted to go to the big city. I wanted to come here. I wanted to learn. I wanted to just broaden my horizons, broaden my palette. And that's where it came from. But thank God I realized how good I had it back at home too. Because like those small town, like little fry shacks and stuff like that, that also is a big part of me too and i'm glad i do realize how good i had it back then yeah those places they i feel like they were overlooked for such a long time and then say what you will about sort of yelp and instagram and the negatives of it but it has helped people reconnect and and rediscover some of those classic roadside shacks and places that uh you went through with your family and then you thought, all right, it's kind of dirty. It's kind of grungy, but there's some sort of charm behind that as well. Um, I'm curious, uh, when you moved to the city for school, what were you going to school for? And were you thinking that you were going to get involved in food at that time? Like, did you end up, did you go to culinary school? Did you end up at Gramercy Tavern on a whim? How did that whole <laughs> thing kind of develop? It really came to me, um, Later in life, I didn't come to school for uh, food. I wanted to study fil film and television. I wanted to be part of that industry. I thought it was very exciting, creative. Um, but I could not help but be like inspired and get bitten by the food bug in New York City. And I mean, when I was growing, when I first came here, it was about, I've been here for about 21 years or so. I remember the first time I discovered Corner Bistro or like Joe's Pizza. Like I've had pizza, I've had hamburgers, but I've never had it at that level where I was like, this is a whole nother world. And in addition to that, fine dining. I've always been curious. I heard words like Le Cirque and Danielle and John George, and I, I didn't know what that stuff meant. We did not have like that level of cooking uh, and where I was from in Connecticut. So I scraped up some money together, and I finally got to go to uh, Le Cirque. I remember I, I was wearing a jacket that didn't fit me. Like I felt like so – like I remember this one guy I walked in reading a paper wearing like a $5,000 suit just kind of glanced and you're like, how did he get in here? <laughs> I'm like, this is, I, I want to leave. I don't want to do this. When I actually sat down and tried the food and like the hospitality, 
that was very exciting. I felt something right away. I'm like, this is something kind of fun, and I don't quite feel like I'm I'm an outsider for sure. But um, it was going back to those restaurants when I had the time, and Gramercy Tavern definitely was the one that really sparked my imagination. I never had food like that that was considered, quote-unquote, American. Mm-hmm. And, and Gramercy Tavern, for those listening that aren't familiar with it, so it is sort of a hybrid restaurant. It's got a bar in front that's... Yep casual and extremely busy yeah. every night of the week somehow <laughs> for its entire duration that it's been open. Yeah. And then it has a back room that has uh, a sort of a, a higher end approach, but that's still kind of Danny Meyer, nice touching the tables hospitality. Yes. So it's still warm, even though the back room is more of a tasting menu mm-hmm. from the food perspective. When you started there, Was that the model, or has it evolved into that model? Was it always a tasting menu restaurant with a front bar area? It always was, and I think that was an aha moment for Danny Meyer, too, when he realized that he actually had two restaurants, as you said, under one roof, where the front was the kind of classic American tavern, kind of come in on a win, sit down, and get a great meal, or just get a good glass of wine, get some good hospitality, then... The back room was more of a, you want to plan for this. You want to maybe get dressed up a little bit. You're going to sit down. You're going to have a multi-course tasting and really see what the chef is capable of. And since then, a couple of his other restaurants have that model built into them where you have the more casual front of the house and then the more fine dining back of the house. But they share the same chef, the same same ingredients. It's just a little more kind of pared down. What's... uh what's your kind of entry point into Gramercy Tavern? Did you answer an ad? Did you show up and say, can I have a trail here? (laughs) Like how did you go from film and TV college, New York to working the line at Gramercy Tavern? It's a lot of dumb luck to be honest with you. Um, That was a restaurant that really inspired me. And now fast forward a couple years, I'm living in New York city. Um, I had a friend that was uh, cooking at a uh, food and wine event a lot of restaurants come together all for charity. And he's like, hey, man, I'm going to sneak in if you want to go and get to try some food. I'm like, I would love to do that. The minute I get through the door, he's like, okay, so, you know, there's this restaurant over here, this restaurant here. Check out these guys are doing like a good little dish. He goes, I think Gramercy Tavern's in the back. I'm like, Gramercy's here. Oh, beelined it right there. The chef at the time, Tom Colicchio, was there with his uh, chef de cuisine, uh, John Schaefer. I just started gushing. I was like... Uh, that that steak you guys do, like it's so amazing. The caramelized onions, like do you do you caramelize them? They add the vinegar. Do you add the vinegar and like let that cook down and caramelize? And I didn't know what I was talking about. I just wanted to recreate that food at home. And they said to me, you know, you seem very uh, sincere and excited about what we do. Here's our card. If you want to come in and watch us cook dinner one night, it would be our pleasure. So I did that. That following like weekend, I went into the kitchen and I sat at the pass and watched the chefs cook, put everything together and the smells. And I recognize a few of the dishes. I'm like, oh, so that's how they cook it like that. Like, wow. I'll never forget. They said, go to the back of the kitchen. That's where the meat roaster and fish roaster are cooking. You can get a better view of what they're doing. The, uh, the meat roaster, I remember a guy had like burns all over his arm and he, and is, he looked kind of like a little bit of rough and tumble guy, but like the way he cooked and moved, it was almost like this grace, this elegance. I'm like, I want to do this. I want to be like as smooth and graceful as this guy because this is something beautiful going on here. I want to learn the magic of the kitchen. And that's how it started. I went back and I trailed repeatedly. And they said, you know what? You seem very, very passionate and we can't get rid of you because you keep coming back. We give you the worst jobs in the kitchen, but you have a smile on your face. (laughs) If you want to do it with a paycheck in hand, we'll, we'll make that happen. That's how I started working at that restaurant. What was the first night like when you were a paid employee of Gramercy Tavern? Did you feel, what did you feel? I felt very nervous. And actually at the time, I was very overweight. I weighed about 125 pounds more than I weigh now. And I was nervous because in Gramercy Tavern, uh, how it starts is you first learn to cook in their front tavern room, which everything is cooked over a hearth fire. And I saw like cooks come out just covered in sweat and everything every night. And I'm very overweight. I'm like, oh my God, am I, am I going to have like a heart attack out there? I can't move that fast. So I actually had to buy knee braces for my legs because my, again, I was in really bad shape back then. So I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get through this. So there was that level of nervousness just on top of, can I do this job? I've given like two months of my life here every day of the week to show I could do this. Can I actually do it now that I'm going to be the one with the pan in my hand and the spoon in the other, mixing something together and putting on the plate? So I was very, very nervous. 
But thank God, the whole culture of Danny Meyer is such where your superior's thoughts is, if you can't do that job, it's not shame on you, it's shame on me. I must have not taught you well enough. I must have not given you the keys and helped develop you to give you the confidence to do this job. So it wasn't on me. If I made a mistake, they were never like, oh, you're the worst. Why do we ever take a chance on you? It was like, ah, we're just going to have to work with you more, man. Make sure you get this down and understand like how the rhythm's supposed to happen to put these dishes out. So there was actually a sigh of relief maybe halfway through it because I went in there with a lot of tension and nervousness and they put, put it put it, put it at rest. I mean, it was still a very hard journey to actually master it, but they gave me the confidence. Since you brought it up, I am curious about, you know, your, your health. And obviously working in a restaurant is, it's difficult mentally and physically. Uh, you say you lost 125 pounds. Mm-hmm. Do you think that the job had anything to do with that directly of you trying to get healthier be- because – at a restaurant, you're tasting a lot, and even though you know it's hot and you're sweating mm-hmm. and you're on your feet for 12 hours a day, you do a lot of eating. And at the end of the night, there's a big opportunity to go drinking for the oh, next yeah. two hours <laughs> with with all with all your kitchen friends. Yeah. So, uh, how did you uh, refocus your health and re sort of focus your life when you started at mm-hmm. Grammar Street Tavern? It was literally the physicality of the kitchen that allowed me to lose like weight without even realizing or trying to do it. I remember one day um, when I would go into the kitchen, they had chef pants and chef coat for you that they laundered for you. So I remember I went to the rack, I grabbed my normal size, I put it on, I was like, huh, this is pretty loose. I had to bring a belt today. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll go down one size. And that happened twice before I actually realized what was going on. And one of the line cooks go, man, it looks like you're losing some weight. Wow, you're looking good. And that was like the aha moment, like, wow, maybe just the physicality of this restaurant is helping me. And now I want to be a little more like, in, like uh, intuitive about this and do it a little more uh, directly. And I started to do things like switch bread to whole wheat, go to brown rice, little things like that. I start to read about like how to maybe continue this. And those little changes along the way enabled it to happen. It probably took about a year and a half. And again, it wasn't something I set out to do. But once it started to happen through like just physicality of the kitchen, then I wanted to be more intentional. And to be honest, at that time, I was still going out after work and getting drinks with the guys, and I was tasting. But I was just trying to be a little more smarter about it. Maybe I would take a tiny spoon of something as opposed to a big mouthful. It wasn't needed. And mm-hmm. I was feeling so good. I wanted to keep on that path and lose that weight. You're probably the, the only person who can claim that they got – a lot healthier as a, as a New York City line <laughs> in cook. In this business, most, for sure. Um, most emerge uh, <laughs> broken mentally. Yeah. Uh, so just sticking with Gramercy, because it is such an important, not only for you, but also in the in the culinary landscape. Mm-hmm. So if Gramercy is sort of like the the... It's like the feeder to the big leagues, you know? It's like I, I looked up, you know, Scranton Wilkes-Barre Rail Raiders is the the farm team for the Yankees. <laughs> and it's like pretty much everyone who comes through that Gramercy kitchen goes on and has developed projects on their own. And you hear dozens of people that say, it's the most important kitchen I ever worked in. Uh, since you were in that kitchen, can you speak to leadership, mentoring, team building, and why it seemed to work so well at Gramercy Tavern? It was a very hard kitchen, to say the least. I mean, what I also think made it hard and also really exciting at the same time where people were engaged and wanted to do their best every day was, as far as I know, it was one of the few kitchens of that size using like the French line system where the cooks were actually playing our own food. A lot of the kitchens I've been to, the cooks are doing their components and they'll pass them up to another person who will actually finally lay the plate out. There was an added layer of complexity here because if I was the person, say, uh, doing the garnish for the meat roaster, I'd be heating up my beans, warming up my sauce, maybe sauteing a vegetable, turn around, pull a plate out of the warmer, put it down, turn around, like plate everything up. I would have to maybe, say, drain a little bit of the butter off something, artfully swish the sauce to the side. Wow, I have more pots going for the next couple of tables. There was a lot to do there. But that was the style and that was the level you were working at. You had to multitask and you had to do it at a high level. And that was how it was set from day one. I think that really has a lot to do with people saying, listen, we're giving you a lot to do. You better figure this out. We're not going to simplify this for you. 
And I've been to a lot of kitchens that do it the other way too, again, where all you have to worry about is perfectly cooking that piece of meat. You, sl- you pass it up and someone else will slice it, they'll plate it, and you just keep cooking your meat. That's all you have to worry about. And I think there's something great about mastering that. But grammar is like, we want you to master that and you're gonna plate it and you're gonna run it up to us so we can take our final look and then you're gonna run back to your station and keep going. Again, the physicality of that kitchen losing weight. I think they, they really want to instill like a sense of uh, ownership in everything you do. And we did take a higher level of pride because between getting there, getting into that restaurant early as we could, that they would let us get in because every cook wanted to get there as soon as they woke up because they knew there was a massive avalanche of prep they had to do. You did everything from scratch, everything. You, you did your own prep. You cooked it upstairs. You got it ready for service. Scrubbed down your station. You just did everything. And again, you were demanded to do that at a high, high level. Maybe they even throw in a private dining event that night too. You had to pick up off your station. But I think that is so exciting that that has helped develop a lot of, like a lot of people I work with now in my like team have gone off to open amazing restaurants and be incredible chefs. I think we all came from that school in a way of almost hard knocks where we're really going to give you a lot of responsibility and you're going to perform at a high level. And I think that's kind of helped grow right out of the gate because that's, that's what we know. We didn't know an easier way of doing it if there is one. We just knew working at that level. Maybe that is a higher level to start out at. But again, I think that helped develop a lot of skill set, multitasking, and that sense of urgency that I know we all still have. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to really dig into Hamburger's Shake Shack and opening up that first location in Madison Square Park. Stick with us here on The Line. Today's program was brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. What do you think of when you hear Wisconsin Cheese? For me, I think cheese curds. Delicious, fresh and squeaky cheese curds. Or deep fried cheese curds. Cheese curds literally anyway, anytime, any place. I think about Andy Hatch and Upland's Cheese. The Farmstead Cheese Company behind Pleasant Ridge Reserve. I think of delicious, stinky Limburger and its long storied history. I think of Dunbarton Blue made by master cheesemaker Chris Raleigh. I think of Ross Grand Cru Sirchois, which was named 2016's World Championship Cheese, and Satori's Black Pepper Bella Vitano, the 2017 U.S. Championship Cheese. Wisconsin produces the world's best cheese with lush grasslands and a glacial water supply that produce the very best milk. Fourth-generation cheesemakers combine old-world tradition with new ideas and the highest standards to make innovative cheeses that win more awards than any other state or country. To learn more, visit wisconsincheese.com. Welcome back to The Line. I'm your host, Eli Sussman. Today, my guest is Mark Rosati. He's the culinary director of Shake Shack. They have over 100 locations in the United States and abroad. And the first thing that I want to ask you is... Uh, how did you become the culinary director? You started off as the manager mm-hmm. of the Madison Square Park location. I imagine quite a bit of responsibility there, as you alluded to the lines that go around the block. What was being a manager like at a burger fast food shack restaurant? And how did you transition from that to being the culinary director? I started at a Shake Shack, and um, to be honest, I did not want the job. I was ready to leave Gramercy. I've done three years in the kitchen under two chefs. I learned so much, and I was ready for something different, a new challenge. I trailed in a few kitchens in New York City, and uh, I wanted to one hand, like, say, learn how to master pasta, make it, cook it, all that stuff, learn that skill set. But on the other hand, I was like, I, I love all of this business. It's not so much the kitchen. I didn't train to be a chef. I was lucky to walk into a great kitchen and learn it from them. But I would also maybe love to learn how to clear a table and like gracefully walk through the dining room and pour wine. And I was kind of in a crossroads. I was like, well, maybe I, I learn another skill set now. I can go to the front of the house. So I did a few trails and I interviewed some different restaurants that I really respected. 
But on the other hand, there was also Shake Shack that had a management opening. And I looked at a shack in a park and go, oh, these guys, they, they probably don't know anything over there. I'm like, I can probably get into this leadership role here, learn from them, and like maybe also help them out because I have the culinary skills. I'll see what happens. I went for the interview. I had one foot in, one foot out, and the GM felt it too. He goes, I don't know, man, if you really want this here. First of all, you have no management experience. I know you worked at Gramercy, and that says a lot. But, you know, we're, we're on a tight ship here. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, 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 cute, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so I came back and did a trail, and I was blown away after I actually stepped foot in this tiny 400-square-foot shack and saw they were using the same meat that we were using at Gramercy. They had the same contacts or produce. And it was actually a very thoughtful manner in which they were cooking and, and serving all the food. I'm like, wow, this is actually very similar to all of Danny's restaurants, but a little more simplistic. And like our dining room is actually a park. I'm like, this, this actually might be the right fit for me. I also thought back to my childhood in Connecticut because I knew what seafood shacks were all about. And this is a burger shack. And it's all about bringing people together in the summertime over delicious food and having fun. I'm like, oh, I get this. I can totally hang with these guys. And uh, within the first year, um, I was just going down in flames. I did not know what was happening to my life. I took this job thinking actually you know, I would have less hours. And uh, I had actually had a friend that opened a restaurant um, in New York City uh, a few weeks before I started the job. And it was very busy. He goes, could you come in and help me out? You know, cut bread, serve water, go in the kitchen, whatever you can do. I'm like, yeah, I can totally do this. He goes, are you sure, though? You just started working for a Shake Shack. I'm like... It's a shack in the park. What are you talking about? I'll have plenty of time. Next thing I know, I'm working six days a week, 14 hours a day, and I'm like looking at this tiny little shack going, what is going on? I, I made the wrong decision. Um, but soon after, like I started to really understand how to run the team and work with them and learn about the food. And back when I started at Shake Shack, everything was made in-house, and it blew my mind. We're a little burger stand. We serve frozen custard, which is a freshly made ice cream, and we have different house-made mix-ins you can throw in there, like chocolate toffee and chocolate truffle cookie dough, and blend it together. The toffee we were making, I'm like, why are we doing this? There's there's Heath Bar, there's Scores, there's there's chocolate toffee we can buy, and they're like, listen, man, we were born off 11 Madison Park. Everything was crafted from scratch, grinding the burgers, making cheese sauce. If we can make it, we're gonna do it, and that blew my mind. You bring up a really interesting point about the sort of dual nature of Shake Shack, which is it's a fast food restaurant on one hand. It's a burger joint, but it is born out of this Danny Meyer mentality of hospitality and also the EMP cook. So mm -hmm. in that regard, you're you know, from the beginning, you're sourcing your meat from Lafreda, right? Yep. Do you still get your meat from Lafreda? Yep. Okay, so you're using a high-end meat product. You're ordering produce. That's all fine when you've got one, two, three locations. How does the supply chain work now that there are <laughs> so many locations? I'm curious from specifically the yep. point of view of like based on the geography of the market. So like in each zone, do you have a meat person and a produce person? And how much prep is still really getting done uh, at the locations? Or do you have a central commissary? How yep. does all that work? When we got to location three, as you were saying, actually, that was the breaking point. We had opened uh, a second location on the Upper West Side of Manhattan as as an experiment because everyone thought the excitement of Shake Shack was a park in New York City. We can drink a beer and eat a burger. You can't do that too many places. And we're like, we're never, no one's going to want to go and actually pay money and sit down indoors. It's not going to be the same. When we opened that one uh, uh, in uh, the Upper West Side, it actually became even busier than the original. And that's when we realized, well, maybe there's something bigger to this than just the park. So we were still making everything from scratch. I mean, we have a very complicated vegetarian mushroom burger that's like a two-day process to make it. We were literally working 24 hours a day between like taking off the stems, roasting them, slicing them, stuffing them, rolling in breadcrumbs. That was the breaking point. We actually had to find... Uh, partners that could make our same exact recipes using our same ingredients and scale it for us, make it more consistent because we cannot grow with like every shack still making everything in house. So that helped tremendously. Is that like a co packer? It is pretty yes. much. Okay. Yep. And, and and so can you just for those listening, can you just explain a little bit of sort of 
How does that process work? Yep. Do you send them a recipe? And Absolutely. So a co-packer for us is pretty much a guy that's going to make our shack sauce exactly how we make it, except instead of us making it in a 25-quart bucket with an immersion blender, they're going to make it in like a 30-foot like cauldron with this massive robotic arm. It's the same exact process just scaled up and they do it in a way where they're so scientific and precise they weigh out all the ingredients to like you know the one thousandth of a gram to make sure it's always perfect we don't have those capabilities so those are people that have helped us grow and they're still good partners to us even today we, we went on this journey maybe about uh eight or nine years ago starting to work with co-packers and, and we're fine dining guys by nature we didn't want to do that we thought no this is not gonna these guys can never make our recipes as good as us they proved us wrong. They can make it more uh, concise, a lot more uh, consistent, and that is a huge, huge blanket for us as we grow is just to make sure when you're biting into the Shack Burger, the sauce will taste the same here as it will in Los Angeles. So as we grew, though, when we opened our second location, we wanted to change the menu. We looked at the Upper West Side, so this is not the same Shack that's in the park. This is a different one. Let's change the menu. Let's be thoughtful. Let's look into our immediate neighborhood and find ways of reflecting back that culinary community to make something more exciting and not so cookie cutter. And we just, that felt natural to us. Fast forward today where we have over 160 locations, they all have slightly different menus. There is a lot of local sourcing and our supply chain team, as you were saying, they're my heroes. Shake Shack would not be where it is without them. They are like literally my stars of what Shake Shack has done because they're the guys that we say, okay, we're opening in LA. They're like, okay, we got to get on a plane. They're going to fly out. They're going to find a meat grinder. They're going to try to find the Pat LaFreda of the West Coast. They're going to work with him on our recipe. They're going to make sure it's the same exact meat raised, no hormones, no antibiotics. And then they're going to get on another plane. And they're going to fly to London. And now they're going up to Scotland, to Aberdeen, because now we're opening in London. They need to find similar cattle. They need to find people raising them lovingly. They need to find a person that's going to grind our meat. That's not easy to do, but all along the way, anytime we've localized, we have to check from very start, from the ranch all the way down to the burger coming into the Shake Shack. And that is something that's so amazing, but they're so dedicated. It's a very large team now because we put such an emphasis on making sure the quality is the best. And also, if we're going to localize in another city, that we're really find the best people to work with that feel like family. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of bandwidth. But at least for us, we feel that's the only way that we can grow and feel really good about it. It's such a fascinating transition to go from what you said, which is making things in five and 25 gallon batches. Once you move from the Cambro and the immersion blender to a co-packer to, oh, now we are buying a farm's worth of tomatoes because that's <laughs> how much tomatoes we go through. It's, uh, it's something that not only has to do with sort of the 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 supply chain and the vertical integration but it also impacts your your staffing and also just the the messaging of the company right like as you grow you have to keep a concise messaging and also training so uh besides the uh supply chain team mm -hmm. that flies around and you're the culinary director what other pieces of the puzzle are there so that when you open a location in dubai what does that really consist of? Like, who who goes and <laughs> and how long do you stay there, and uh, and what does that look like? Dubai is a great example because that was actually our seventh location we opened up. We we made a few big jumps. Our our fourth location actually was in South Beach, Miami, and again we had to figure out how to get meat down there. Like, where's the produce coming from? Like that. Those are big challenges that we actually did not want to do. We had amazing opportunities came coming to us, and most of them actually were were people saying, "Listen, hey, Danny Meyer, we, what this Gramercy Tavern's hot. Like, we want to bring that to South Beach. I have this new amazing project." He's like, "Well, Gramercy Tavern is singular. It's unique. It's a jewel, but we have Shake Shack. We're planning on opening a few more. Do you want that? Sure. Well, we're happy to get anything from you." So we had an amazing opportunity to go and open this amazing location in South Beach. Fast forward a few years later, we're now in Dubai. That right there was a massive, massive jump because we had to learn a whole nother world. The word supply chain, now we're at about six locations about to open Dubai. That was the first time we as a company heard supply chain. We were like, okay, the supply chain. Let me just quickly get on my supply. <laughs> oh, God, we're not ready for this. We had to figure it out. Um, that opening from start to finish was about a year plus in the work. I took my first trip out to the Middle East with our CEO, Randy Garuti. 
um, about a year before we opened up. And there I am now in Kuwait, where the company, our partner's headquarters are in Kuwait. They were starting to do construction on Kuwait, Shake Shack, and Dubai. And they said, we just want support. We want to make sure not only do we have the food, but what we love about you guys, the reason we came to you was your company's culture. You guys are some of the best in the business. We love the hospitality. We want to make sure that sticks. We want to make sure there's a good injection of great hospitality in our teams, and they're going to learn and grow and multiply from you guys. We're like, great. And they look at me. We're a very small company now. And I go, okay, so Mark does the food, and he's also doing training now. Mark will go and live wherever the first shack opens for two months. And I'm kind of like, what? Wait, 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 guys, guys, whoa, let's just talk about this for a little bit here. We're prom- promising a lot. Um, thank God Dubai opened first because it is a very big, unique city. Um, I had a lot of fun there. It was very, very, I had a chance to really kind of get everything together and understand it. We brought over a team of 11 people. We brought over some of our best trainers. We brought over some of our best uh, operations guys. And literally a few weeks before we go out there, we're saying, okay, you've been doing an amazing job. You're now a trainer. And they're like, huh? Like, do you have a passport? Why? You're, like, you're, <laughs> you're training. Going yeah, you're going to Dubai. <laughs> and it was an exciting experience. But from the year out, we were in the desert in Kuwait, like tasting lettuce, like looking at ingredients for shack sauce, making batches, making sure it was going to work. And if it didn't work, we had to figure out what ingredients we could possibly import or give that team more chances to source it within the region. It took a lot of time. We had to create training materials. We had to create operations manuals and stuff we did not have. We had to give them like shelf life uh, sheets on almost all of our ingredients. They say, so what's the shelf life on a tomato? Like it's a tomato. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You tell if it's bad. Yeah, but and then they're like, "Well, then when we cut into it, what's the shelf life?" I'm like, "Oh my god, you got like we have a lot of work to do to answer these questions." So we had to put all that together in a manual. Thank God again, the Shake Shack team that I started working with in Madison Park way back in those days was the people that were creating all that information. They were amazing at what they do, and they're still a big part of the Shake Shack leadership today. But if it wasn't for amazing, brilliant minds on the Shake Shack team in the early days, we would have never gotten to this level. We would have been stumbling along the way, and we were throwing curveballs left and right. But we had to give our partners support to grow. But the great thing was we went to school with these guys. They asked us so many questions. We had to start to answer these questions. And once we answer them, we're like, well, we have all this materials now. Like, Here is the procedure of how to properly cook and season a Shake Shack burger. We never really had this before. I'm like, now we can open more locations in other parts of America and grow because we developed this through our partnership. So essentially, you were you were all running Shake Shack like it was a chef driven restaurant where your sous chef kind of shows you how to pick up a dish, and you needed to transition to more of a, for lack of a better comparison, a McDonald's model where like anyone can do it. Did did the company? Uh, poach or lure anyone away from a, a huge fast food brand to join the team? Or did you do did you just use your existing folks and develop everything internally? We used our existing folks to do it. Um, our partners had come from a couple of those bigger restaurant groups uh, internationally. So they had a lot of operational know-how and they knew what you know consistency looked like and great training looked like. So they would ask us for stuff. We would give it to them. They would look at it and go, okay, this is great, but maybe if you change this, the wording, this and that, maybe this format... They, they worked with us and they understood. They came to us when we had two locations. We were the smallest group these guys have ever worked with in the history of the company. And to give you an idea, international, they run all the Starbucks in the Middle East. These guys are big players. They run Cheesecake Factory. And okay. we're like, are you sure you want Shake Shack? We only got these two little restaurants here. And they're like, man, we tried your food. We love the experience. You guys are doing something that is like we don't really see too often in this industry. There's something a little more deeper about you guys and like we want you. So they did work with us to develop it. And in those early days, we're all wearing 10 hats. I was wearing like training, operations, culinary, and like everyone was doing that. Our trainers who were line cooks that we uh, promoted to trainer and flew them out to the Middle East, they're like, they're, they're like the people they're training, like they're their best friends, they're their doctors. It's like, there's so much, like we all were just excited and we were way in over our heads, but that really, again, helped us get to the next level understanding of how to grow. So now let's actually talk about what you do now. And obviously, you probably still wear many hats, but from a culinary direction type of perspective where you're creating specific dishes 
for regions. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you can give just a couple examples of things that are very specific to the country that they exist in and also a little bit about what that process is like. So when you're in Japan or Turkey or wherever it might be, how do you kind of drill into what the burger slash sandwich will become at that location? It's, it's, it first starts off with me like, uh, I try not to read and get too many recommendations on a city because I only have one opportunity of getting off of a plane and making my first really personal connections with that city. I've had experiences in the past where, I mean, everyone means well when they do this. I probably do this to my friends when they come visit. I'm like, oh, you got to look out the window. So that's this. This is this building. It's famous. It was in this movie. And like, it's a good place to get like a coffee and this and that. And oh, I don't like this building because, you know, that there's a bad doorman in there. But it's still a nice building. It's like, I'm not drawing my own personal connection here. I need to be like walking the streets or like in the car by myself, totally quiet, just observing, looking, feeling, sensing. And I think that is what's helped us create a connection in a new city or a new country where at the end of the day, I can't do what I think someone else is going to want to see on the menu. I have to do what I want to see on the menu. And that can only come through that connection. I kind of look at a new city and say to myself, okay, Like, say, Tokyo, for instance. Okay, so now I'm walking the streets. I'm kind of figuring this out. I can't go to the coolest coffee shop and say, okay, maybe we'll use, like, their beans or something like that on our menu because they're very popular. I have to walk in that door and say, if I lived in Japan, would this be my coffee shop? Yeah, it's popular, but do... Does it connect with me? Do I get excited? Do I like the people working behind there? At the end of the day, I'm trying to find stuff that's really cool, maybe unique, or maybe something I'm it's familiar but doing it a little differently that I can then draw that personal connection with and say, okay, there it is. This is my coffee shop. Uh, if I live in this city, I would make a point every day to go in here because the people are awesome. They're, they're roasting their own beans in the back there and like the way they bring it all together. I love their music. These are the people I love. And that's when I start to say, these are the people I want to work with now. There has to be that connection. At the same time, drawing a personal connection, I'm also trying to do something that's going to reflect back uh, the culture too. So it has to be a personal connection. At the same time, I have to say, well, what is pop or what is something that's in, say, Tokyo that people that live here are super proud of that maybe is only available here or again, maybe they're doing something that is classic, but they're doing it to the next level. And once I find those agreements, my, my, probably my best example here is black sesame paste. That is something that I wasn't expecting. If I was to Google Japan, and I did, I saw maybe a little bit of green tea and stuff like that. Matcha comes up every now and then. Um, But the black sesame really blew me away. What I was reacting to was, in Tokyo, everything is just so visual. It can't just taste good. There has to be this cool visualness to it. And I started to, like, I saw, like, people making uh, donuts that had these camouflage military patterns on there. I was just like, how do you make that? That's so cool. I've never seen that before. I was thinking, well, what if we were to do, like, a very monotone-looking concrete where it's, like, different shades of, like, white and gray and black all blended together? We've never done anything like that, but make it super intentional, make it look really cool, but also it's got to taste great. And the black sesame was kind of my gateway. And then once I found this great black sesame paste that was almost kind of like the Nutella of the black sesame roll, it was a little sweet. It was like this beautiful mouthfeel. Like, how can I now take this ingredient that is very much Asian inspired and now bring it into an American roadside burger stand? So I put into our custard and I added marshmallow sauce, which I feel is very American. And I added some local cocoa nibs from a little uh, chocolate maker, Bean to Bar guy found Japan, really cool guy. And once it all came together, there was different textures, flavors, and colors. But I felt at the end of the day, we were leading with being who we are, we're being Shake Shack, we're giving uh, one of our signature concretes and using a lot of American flavors. But that little touch of black sesame just gave it the right flavor, the right look, and that to me felt very authentic, and very honest. In the Middle East, uh is the does the meat have to come from a halal butcher and did you have a lot of difficulty sourcing that and i'm also curious how you dealt with uh with aspects of not only creating like a cool dish but mm-hmm. also uh working with the individual cultures of the country so you serve beer in new york i don't yep. know do you serve alcohol at the kuwait <laughs> shake shack and uh and What's a specific dish to the Middle East and uh, and then one other location that, that you've come up with? Okay. One of the things like uh, we always try to do first and foremost, and Dubai was the one where 100 ideas were starting to fly out of us because 
you can't serve beer unless you're uh, in a hotel that has a license to serve alcohol in Dubai. And if you're part of that hotel and you have a restaurant there, you can serve it. But we're mostly in malls, which don't have that license. So we knew going right in, we could not bring our beer and our wine, which is also a very big part of who we are. So we said, well, do we make mocktails? That's a very big part of like the Middle East culture. All these juice cocktails, is that something we add to our menu to do something unique? We were batting ideas back and forth. And I remember uh, the marketing guy uh, on our partner's team said to me, listen, man, like I showed him all these crazy ideas. Uh, he goes, you know, this is great, man. Like, I, good creativity. I love it. I love you really doing your research here. Like, thank you for uh, thinking of this. He goes, but you know what, man? I got to be honest with you. You don't need this. You you guys do something special in New York that we don't know how to do here. Don't put like, you know, like uh, dates in the shake. That's great. That's great. But we want you to lead with you. Be yourself. Be an American brand because we don't have that. You know, we we don't know how to make a burger or milkshake. We just want you to be yourself. Don't think you have to change it up for us or anything like that. And those were very, like, uh, sage, like, advice that I was getting back there from them. And I still think about that today when I go into a new market and I get excited because I might see some stuff that I'm like, whoa, wow, like, this is such a cool ingredient. I'm going to throw this in everything. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. Just being Shake Shack in a new country is exciting enough because we don't have you. We we want to learn about you and understand your menu. So that was something that I kind of led with. Um, but over the years, I also said, again, like the way we like to kind of be inspired and reflect back, we still do that. So when we open in Turkey, baklava, some of the best baklava I've ever had. There's a story to a hundred year plus little baklava maker called Gilolo. And everyone was like, if you were to go to someone's house during like a birthday party or celebration, you better bring a box of this or else you're not going to get it. If you bring anything in fear, like what's wrong with you? What, you had disrespect here? You're not bringing the good stuff? So I went there and tried it and was blown away. And I think it was really the quality of the nuts they were putting in there that I said, I need to create something like this. I don't want to exactly put baklava and a concrete and blend it together. It's a little too easy. What if I deconstruct and I get you know, this amazing pistachio powder from this guy and maybe get like some sort of like a crispy texture of a cookie. Again, trying to bring a little bit of America in there too because I don't want to not forget who we are. And just bringing all those different flavors together and making like an orange honey sauce and all that stuff. So when it blends together, it has the flavors and textures of a baklava. But again, we're leading with being an American brand. So there's a lot of stuff we do like that. I want to know about your relationship with uh, Randy Grudy and the and the leadership that that gets put forth to these locations because it is more than just a burger shack, as you've said many times. There is a huge focus on culture and community that to the outsider might seem a little bit weird because people are used to just having their burger flippers be a high school kid who's looking for some extra bucks on the side. It's not really like that for your company. Uh, I imagine that that's just a trickle down Danny Meyer effect, but Randy has put his vision on the company. Can you talk a little bit about how you work together Mm -hmm. and also some of the, I guess, modern technological impact that has been put forth by him and the company, but also how you've kept it personal at the same time with, with people being at sort of the forefront of the company. Mm -hmm. Randy is without a doubt and always will be the biggest cheerleader Shake Shack has ever known. He has just been so athletic and energized and like, I've never seen that guy anything less than like at 9% of, I mean, nine, like 90% of energy. He's like a ball of energy. He's always inspired. He's very off the cuff. He's always creative. And that is where a lot of like the vision of Shake Shack comes from. Like he is so in the moment and he gets a lot about how, who we are. Again, there are times where we'll question the path we go down. Like, is this Shake Shack? Is this Shake Shack? Randy's always the first one to really kind of figure it out, how we can be who we are and maybe adapt a little bit or just say, you know what, this is not for us. We have to stay on this straight line. This is our true north. He has been amazing. I have meetings with him probably once a week where we'll sit down, we'll talk about new menu items, food, we'll talk about travel. We're about to open in um, Seattle and San Francisco this year. It's all we're talking about. Randy spent a lot of time working for restaurants in Seattle. He knows the city well. He sent me an email early today. He goes, hey, man, there's this great, like, uh, 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 English muffin maker in, like, Napa Valley. You know, just check them out, check them out. I don't know if it's going to work, but, like, there's a lot of that coming in. I know it's not just me. I know every single department, every single employee gets these emails from Randy around the clock where Randy gets an idea, he gets inspired. And even if it's maybe 
an idea that maybe takes a little time to get it actually to come to fruition, you become so inspired that you want to take the reins of that vision and run with it. So we cannot have asked for a better leader to help get us from one check to 160 plus, and I think still do it in a really, uh, a really amazing way and still be ourselves. And at the same time, Randy also gets that the world is changing. And I think we were saying something like, you know, if a shark doesn't keep moving forward, it just dies. And it's like, we built the company off of first being a very simple, humble burger stand in Madison Park where the menu did not change. We were like, well, maybe we draw some inspiration from in and out Those guys do not change their menu. Look at how amazing their food is. And they got big lines. And then after a while, again, Randy, the true north, goes, that's cool. That's cool. And, you know, I might have said the same thing a year ago. He goes, but you know what, man? We're born out of fine dining. You know, those menus in Gramercy and 11 Madison Park, they're always changing. He's like, that's our DNA. I think we need to embrace that. Let's throw some different lemonades uh, that are seasonal. Let's change all of our menus worldwide. Let's create new burgers. That's Randy. So going into today, we actually opened a location uh, in New York City, our latest one in Astor Place. There are no cashiers. We're known for our hospitality, but we also know technology is changing. So we have to say to ourselves, if you walk into a Shake Shack and there's a kiosk there, what does that look like? What does that feel like? Is that a bad experience? You need a person there all the time. So at the end, at the end of the day, we're not 100% sure what the answer is to that question. But we still said, when you pick up your food, there's chances for hospitality because there's still people cooking that food. And they're going to be the ones that bring it to you and bring you some of that excitement. Say, hey, man, I hope you enjoy the burger I just cooked it. I hope you enjoy it. If you like it, tell me so. If not, man, I'll make sure I get it for you next time. There's so many other places in the experience of Shake Shack to touch a guest and make sure they're feeling great and feeling connection. So Randy's the first one to embrace technology like this and say, I don't know if technology is a bad thing. I don't know if it's a good thing, but we're going to experience it. We're going to try it ourselves, and we're going to answer that question because we can't ignore what's happening. We have to be part of what's relevant and what the conversation is today. I'm, I'm happy that you brought up Astro Place because I was going to ask about that under the context of two things uh, that, are, that are related. The first is just the minimum wage that's happening in New York City. So mm-hmm. by December 31st of 2019, it's $15. And also uh, Union Square Hospitality Group has the hospitality included strategy mm-hmm. that's being rolled out across many restaurants. So how is Shake Shack dealing with, I guess, all three of those, which is <laughs> technology where you might not need as many people anymore, rising wages, and also there's this whole hospitality included uh, component. So mm-hmm. I know that's a lot, but if you can kind of just unpack it in the context of, of Shake Shack and and what your goals and intentions are with, with all of that. Well, that's the thing. Is like We always try to offer more than the minimum wage in all of our locations. We want amazing people to be attracted to us and just help make Shake Shack even more amazing than it is today. So we realized to take the top people, you got to pay them a good amount of money, a good wage. So Astor Place is the location where it is kind of a bit of a uh, try out different ideas. And again, we designed a kitchen to be even more effective than it has been in the past. The most important part for us right now is making sure the burgers and the shakes are as delicious and as perfectly cooked as possible. So again, in the past, we may have looked at technology and said, no, no, this is not us. Like we are like, you know, totally hands on with everything we do. We have to start to take a look harder because again, you're saying r- wages are rising. We need to start answering the question now of how we're going to figure out how to pay people the proper wage, run an amazing shake shacks to keep growing our business. So right now, the idea for us is we really don't have the answer to all these questions, but as long as we can start to play around, figure out and say, kiosk technology, what's that seem like? Well, let's build one now before we have to figure answer, answer these questions down the road and make sure we're vetting every single possible way of approaching that. You're a man who's always on planes. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's a huge part of your life. In the next six months, what's opening and where are you heading? Um... I was saying actually a little earlier today uh, that I was pleasantly surprised that I've been a New Yorker. I love this city. This is my home. This is where I'm happiest. Um, but because of our growth over the past couple of years, I have spent uh, many, many, many days on planes. Uh, that same year when we opened Dubai, uh, we also opened in Washington, D.C., um, Philadelphia. I was... I spent more time outside New York City than in New York, and uh, it was very, very uh, exciting and fun because I was meeting new people, going to new cities, whole new cultures in the Middle East. Um, Then after a while, 
I was like, oh man, I'm missing home. I'm missing my friends. I actually had uh, people stop calling me when they were having like birthday parties and stuff. I'm like, hey, what happened? I just saw like on social media, you had a birthday party. Ah, you know, we, we just assumed you weren't here because every time we do call you, you're not here. I'm like, oh, that's fair enough. Um, but the great thing is as we keep growing, we keep adding an amazing infrastructure and more and more people. So uh, coming into this year, it's still going to be a good amount of travel, but we're really excited because we're going to be opening in uh, Seattle. So opening a few more shacks on the West Coast. Um, first time opening one in Washington State, so we're really pumped about that. We're also going to further grow in California. We're down in the south there. We have San Diego and L.A., San Francisco. That's another one I'm very excited about, like another amazing food culture city. Pass that, Birmingham, Alabama. Also going to Nashville. And then jumping really far out there, we have Hong Kong happening sometime this year. So it's a lot of different food scenes and a lot of different amazing people to meet and try to figure out again how we're going to be ourselves and offer the same experience people remember from the park when it was just one location. But also, again, try to keep expanding and growing and evolving as Shake Shack. Savor your one month on the ground <laughs> in New York City before you, uh, before you get back on a plane. Mark, thanks for joining us and shedding a little light into behind the scenes at Shake Shack and what you do there. Uh, it's been really interesting to hear about all the things that went from growing it from one location into 160 plus now with, with many more on the way. Uh, we wish you the best of luck as you, uh, as you get on a plane soon to go to Seattle and then Hong Kong. <laughs> Uh, thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Eli. Thank you. And all you out there, join us every Tuesday at 11 a.m. for a brand new episode of The Line here on Heritage Radio. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.